Good afternoon, Paul. Good afternoon, Ajahn Sabu. So today is uh, Sunday, 26th of July, 2020. We're making a special recording. Yes, I thought since the coronavirus locked down and we're not encouraging people to visit the monastery, they might appreciate a video uh, with me reflecting on Dhamma as some kind of uh, offering um, for tomorrow on the 27th of July, which will be my 86th birthday. Sato. So there's uh, one thing we were discussing the other day, which I think many people would enjoy hearing you talk about, is how you speak about Dhamma as being pure consciousness. Could you say something about that, please? Yeah, that's, uh, when you meditate, <laughs> when you do the kind of meditation, not on concentration, but on reflection, you begin to recognize that words have no empty quality, you know, they just are phenomena that arise and ceases. And I remember struggling in my early years with Buddhism, trying to, to uh, define everything with words, you know, wanting to uh, take the Pali words and seek their equivalents in the English language and trying to get the perfect word for dukkha, for suffering, and because there are various views and opinions about whether suffering is the proper uh, translation for the Pali word dukkha. And then when you get into that which has no form, into silence, into the silence of consciousness, what do you call that? You know, is it, you know, you call it consciousness or you call it Dhamma or you call it the unborn, or the uncreated or the unconditioned. You know, they're all words pointing to the absence of a word, of a concept. It's not an object anymore. So after a while you begin to recognize consciousness and Dhamma, they're both, you know, at this very moment in every single human being's experience of parent here and now. Everybody knows they're conscious and the translation for Santitiko, Pali word for Santitiko Dhamma is a parent here and now. And just uh, learning to trust this, uh, this kind of intuitive awareness of experience rather than trying to define it with words makes life much more simple. It becomes, rather than becoming more complicated, uh, more abstract, uh, more confusing, everything simplifies to ultimate simplicity. So that which is not born doesn't die, doesn't begin or end, whatever you call it, consciousness. Some people, you know, might argue about that, but, but in terms of experience, consciousness isn't born. I don't create consciousness. It's not a word. I mean, it is a word, but it just points to the reality of being here and now, which is very apparent for every single human being. And so when one says, when one talks about realizing Dhamma, it's about realizing that in one's experience. Realizing when, when consciousness knows itself, it's no longer being used as a, a, through forms, through, through, through the senses, through seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, or thinking. You know, when, when you're not involved in sensory uh, sending the senses outward to, to their objects, what's left is still awareness. And it's like the space between words, like that which is behind 
uh, that is present all the time, no matter if you're uh, going mad or you're peaceful or you're, you're a, a, a very good virtuous person or a very corrupt one. Consciousness is always here and now and it's always pure. It's not, it's not stained by the actions or inactions or forms that appear, uh, that arise and appear and manifest in consciousness. So you could say consciousness is the unmanifest. It's not, you can't find it as an object. You know, it's not something you can show somebody else, but you know very directly because it's what we really are. Uh, we're that consciousness is our true nature. The forms that we identify with, such as the, the sentient uh, experiences through seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, thinking, feeling <clears throat> through, the, through the five khandhas, these are very mortal, changing, unstable forms that arise and cease in consciousness. Where consciousness doesn't arise and cease, it's always here and now, timeless, and it, 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 it encourages us to you know, the Buddha encouraged us to investigate consciousness, to, to really notice it, get beyond the, the limitation of words, of thoughts, of feelings, to, to recognize what we call awareness, being aware of itself. And in Thai, they call it dit and dit, when the consciousness knows itself. So you spoke about recognizing the space between thoughts as one way of noticing the awareness of thoughts. And then when thoughts cease, you're there with awareness. And then some people have been talking about how thoughts go quiet, but the five senses are still operating. So that's not yet consciousness without objects because they're still objects of the senses arising. How, do you, how would you suggest working with that? Well, look at consciousness as a kind of the substratum. It's the ultimate reality, really. You just take a sentence, you know, a kind of mundane, ordinary thought, such as I am a human being. And, you know, the, the words arise and cease. And when the, in between the uh, before you even think the the pronoun I here, yeah, there's consciousness, but we don't notice it. We, it's a, it's empty. It's it's aware, and then we intentionally think I, and then there's space between I and M, space between M and A, and space between A and human, and space between human and being. And after you've thought being, there's still space or consciousness. The consciousness remains the same, whatever words you put into it. It's, it's always the, the stable factor, the still, uh, still stillness that we, and serenity that every human being longs for. So it's never absent from us, we just don't notice it. We become so involved with the words, you know, we're very, uh, thinking kind of cerebral species. We, unlike other species of mammals, we, we think a lot. We have a uh, vibrant vocabulary, we full of ideas, concepts, uh, objects to think about. And is silence, is the silent consciousness or the sound of silence an object? Or is it tamacha? Is it natural? Is it dhamma? You know, that's what we really are. We, some people think of when we, when I talk about the silence or sound of silence, that it's still an object of awareness where it is awareness aware of itself. Uh, and it's not a, a, an object that arises and ceases. So we can call that objectless awareness, you know, because even though you know, there's awareness and there's a silence. 
It's not an object that that you can get beyond. You know, try it. I used to spend hours meditating on trying to get beyond the silence because I I had this idea of objectless awareness as the ultimate goal, only to never find a way beyond it. You can always add to it with thoughts, with feelings, you know, distracting yourself through looking at things or talking or eating or various ways to distract the mind from the awareness, but the awareness, awareness of itself. But that's not, you know, when you see the futility, when you get to the place of no return, you can't get beyond the silence. And it's peaceful. Suddenly you realize that peacefulness is our very nature. It's with us all the time. When we're looking for it uh, externally, we're never quite, you know, we have peaceful moments when everything's quiet, but you can't sustain that kind of peace. It has no sustainability because it's, it's subject to so much interruption, distraction, problems, worldly problems, uh, even the changing of the weather and so forth. And what, what can you, you know, you can't find peace, uh, real peace, peace that doesn't arise and cease uh, in sankharas because the very nature of sankharas condition from or conditions or phenomenon is that they are always in the process of change of transition from birth to death, from beginning to ending. So uh, the futile efforts to find peace is some kind of external control over the environment where everything is, is quiet and not distracted. You, you can't, you, you know, you have moments where you feel peace with that, with a particular scenic situation, but, but it's not sustainable peace. Where this kind of peace, consciousness aware of consciousness, is with us all the time, even in the midst of the battlefield. You know, the battlefield arises and ceases, but what is the basis behind the battlefield, the conflicts, the fears, the desires that we have, that we create into consciousness, is, is always present. And so this is, you know, what we call the release from suffering. It's the, it's the neuro, reality of neurota, the suffering ends, even though you still may have a physical body that's aging, sick, uh, and all kinds of problems in the family, in the society, in the world, of what climate change, COVID-19 pandemic, you know, how can we ever find peace when all these terrible things are happening around us? But, you know, when we're looking for a world where there's no pandemic, no, where the climate is stable forever, you know, you, you're going to be terribly disappointed because that's not the way it is. That's not the Dhamma. The Dhamma is apparent here and now, so it, it's not changing. And what doesn't change in our experience, always in the present moment, is consciousness. We can call it consciousness. We can call it uh, Dhamma, the unborn, uncreated, unformed, unconditioned. But what it is, is, is like this. You know, it, it doesn't matter what you call it so much as to recognize that this is the end of suffering. And it's non-personal. Consciousness is not, you, you know, start, as soon as you start to personify it, you've lost it because to personify consciousness, you have to start thinking. Consciousness is me, it's mine, I'm conscious. Uh, and if you stop thinking, you know, then what's left is consciousness. But it doesn't say it belongs to anybody. It doesn't make value judgments. It doesn't criticize. In order to make value judgments, to criticize, to say this is the best 
or this is the highest, or this is the lowest. You have to start thinking. And the space between thoughts is awareness that doesn't arise and cease. The space, the, the silence between thoughts, the silence behind thoughts is the same silence. It's not a, uh, it doesn't shift or change into any other than just, it's like this, this silent mind the serenity that one enjoys from it. Once you're willing to recognize it and surrender to it, you have to abide in it, let it be you rather than always creating yourself as someone with problems, someone with doubts, with a man or a woman or a right, rightist or a leftist or, you know, whatever identities you prefer to uh, to use for your own experience of life, you know, you give up all that. There's no identity. There's nothing to identify with because this is universal consciousness. It's not, it's not Ajahn Sumedho's consciousness or Ajahn Asoko's consciousness. It's just consciousness universal. It's perfect, it's complete. So in order to realize this awareness that is aware of phenomena arising and ceasing, we don't need to get rid of phenomena. We don't need to get rid of experience of emotions, feelings, experience in order to realize this, do we? No, no, because they're not really the problem. This is a realm, you know, that we're experiencing uh, in, a, in a human form, and it's fraught with old age, sickness, death, loss, grief, sorrow, despair, and anguish. It's, you know, and we have senses, so we, we, you know, an enlightened being still sees, hears, smells, tastes, touches, thinks, and feels life. You know, it's not that you you suddenly become like a zombie or an alien. Uh, you can't relate to the conditioned realm. I mean, that is not, you know, that, that, that's just impossible because when we have insight into Dhamma, we, you know, no matter how profound it might be, we still have a human form that is aging. Like tomorrow, on the 27th of July, I'll be 86. This is an 86 year old phenomenon that was born 86 years ago. And is it, you know, do I claim it as, they say, you know, it's my birthday. These are the conventions. You know, Ajahn Sumedho's 86th birthday, it's a convention. But actually, you know, uh, consciousness is, doesn't have an age. You know, bodies have ages, as we all are very much aware of. Nobody's going to argue that point. So even the Buddha got old, got sick, and died. You know, this, uh, even the, the Lord Buddha himself of 2,563 years ago, uh, you know, after a perfect, complete enlightenment, still had to live with his body till it, till it fired the body, no longer sustained consciousness. But consciousness didn't die with the Buddha. The Buddha didn't really die. The body uh, of the Buddha died, that was all. But this Buddha is the awareness, is consciousness. Buddha, Dhamma, or consciousness aware of itself. You know, they're not just uh, historical events in, in, a, in the Buddhist religion. It's beyond that. When we take refuge in Buddha, Dhamma, Sangha, it's not taking refuge in, in, in something of the past. It's always the present. When Lung Po Cha was encouraging us to use the, the Kamborikam, the mantra, Puto, that's the Buddha's name. So it's, it's apparent here and now to know, isn't it? To Puru, they translate Puto into Thai as Puru, the knowing. 
So consciousness is knowing. It's not personal knowing. It's like, like me knowing. Uh, I, you know, I have to think and think about that I, I am the knowing or I am the knower. That, but if I stop thinking, there's still knowing in the silence of consciousness, aware of itself, there's knowing it's like this. It's not, it's not judging anything. It's not, you know, we, 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 we use our thinking mind as our way of experiencing mind. We have to define uh, sankharas. We have to define conditions, define phenomena, give them, you know, whether we think they're important, not important, beautiful, ugly, good or bad, you know, we always have some kind of reaction uh, to criticize or define it with with a quality. But qualities are all sankharas; they're all changing phenomena. And 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 in the scriptures, uh, the suttas of the Tripitaka, you know, the Buddha emphasizes that phenomena, sankharas, conditions are empty. They have no soul. They have no, they're, they're not a real person. You know, they're the kind of uh, a permanent person or a permanent soul or entity. They are empty phenomena. And what is an empty phenomena is consciousness. It's what life is, what is life itself. And you know, these, these conditions if without consciousness wouldn't exist. You couldn't have a body uh, and a mind with, without consciousness. You know, so, you know, a, a dead body is no longer conscious of itself. It's, it's you know, the senses start decaying uh, and the, the body goes through the process of disintegration and decay, which is what it's supposed to do because it's nothing but but food, you know, it's a, a sack of food that we identify with and give so much importance to. You know, that's why we have to eat every day because, you know, you can't live on thin air, but you can, the body needs food for its survival. And yet the body is our main identity. You know, what we look like, whether we're black or white, male or female, tall or short, fat or thin, you know, this is definitely where we create endless egotistical problems and worries about our appearance and our age, our gender. There's no end to those kind of problems. Uh, it, it, you create, start with one, you create 10 more kind of problems around the same thing. But when you let go of sankharas, relinquishing your grip, your blind, ignorant grip of sankharas, what's left when you've let go, you've not destroyed them. You don't have to annihilate them, terminate them in any way, just loosen your grip. It's this, this, this blind attachment, ignorant, conditioned attachment to phenomenon that is the cause of suffering. And this is, can be proved when we observe, you know, if you begin to recognize, to realize the gap between the words, the silence behind the sound, then, then you, you realize your true nature is, is that. It's not a, you're not a, uh, a, a phenomenon, you're not a condition that depends on other conditions for survival. And so there's nothing to be afraid of, you know, where death for most of us, for most people is, you know, something that we think, you know, it means the end of everything. The body dies, the body decays, it gets cremated or buried or whatever custom you might choose or someone else might choose after you're dead. <laughs> you, <laughs> it just it disintegrates on its own. You don't have to get rid of it. And, and one can always access the silence, sound of silence, pure consciousness, awareness, in, in, because it's a kalika dhamma, it's timeless. It's not, 
it's not dependent on time, on a beginning or an end, where objects that we see through the senses are all about time-bound conditions. Every thought has a beginning and an ending. Every emotion has a beginning and an ending. Everything we see, everything we hear, smell, taste, touch. You know, the universe has a beginning and an ending. So, you know, the beginning and ending is, is the very nature of what we call in Pali Sankara or phenomena or conditions. What isn't conditioned then? Can one condition know another condition? Can you, do you think a Sankara can know another Sankara? You know, it doesn't work that way because Sankaras are empty. They're, they have no, no life of their own except through consciousness. So consciousness brings life into the body. It's the light, the luminosity of consciousness that we are rather than the physical form that we are blindly, ignorantly attached to and identify with. Anupa, you speak about trusting the awareness. You often encourage people to trust the awareness. What are you pointing at there, using the word trust rather than another one? Well, we're so conditioned, you know, our cultural conditioning from the time you're born, you start like a newborn baby, isn't conditioned yet. It is conscious being, the human form is conscious. The, the consciousness is not personal, it's, it's natural, you know, so the baby didn't create consciousness, but the form a human baby born and alive is a conscious form. <clears throat> it doesn't identify itself with anything. It has no language, no memory to, to, to think about things, to pass value judgments about anything. <clears throat> and then after birth, it's conditioned, you know, by the mother, by the father, by the family, by the social background, by the culture, by the religion. All these, you know, are conditions that are imposed on newborn infants, children as they're growing up. We're, we identify with these, with empty phenomena as ourself, as our personality. When you try to find a, a living person, when you really look inward and ask yourself, is there a real person? Is there a real Ajahn Samedo inside this body? The mind goes quiet. The, you can't find, I can't find Ajahn Samedo. I can think Ajahn Samedo. You know, I wasn't born with that name. It was given to me when I was 31 years old. Samedo anyway, not Ajahn. But that's a name that people identify me in, the, in this life as Ajahn Sumato, Lung Pao Sumato. But when I look for Lung Pao Sumato, I see a body, 86 year old body. You know, is that Ajahn Sumato? Is on a conventional level? Yes, you have to, you know, use conventions for communication. We, you know, we realize that. But Ajahn Sumedho is only a convention. It's not a person, a kind of permanent personality, a permanent soul, a permanent reality. And when I try to find it, look inward to see where Ajahn Sumedho is located, I can't find anything except silence, awareness. So what is the trusting? Trusting is because we're so highly conditioned, you know, we, we, we trust the conditioning, you know, like in my own experience of believing that I'm Ajahn Sumato all the time, 
you know, it's something, you know, I never questioned until I became a monk. And uh, I just assumed, you know, I was Robert Jackman uh, because my mother told me that was my name. So that was my first name. And I assumed that when I became Ajahn Sumedho, then I started using that. <laughs> and I think it was Robert Jackman. And it, it, you know, that's a convention you might have on your passport or something, but there's no such thing as Robert Jackman. <laughs> and my British passport, it's, uh, it's Bhikkhu Sumedho. These are conventions. They're, they, you know, they're for worldly relationships, for existing in society. But are you really, am I really Robert Jackman, Ajahn Sumato? And I've acquired a few new names as my age gets, as I get more years in the Sangha. They're conventions only, they're empty phenomena. But what I do realize that is from birth to this very moment sitting here in my kuti at Wat Ratnawan is awareness. And then the advice of the Buddha is to trust this awareness, to make it clear, to make it, you know, your real refuge and to recognize it, the silence, the sound of silence, consciousness knowing itself is like this. So you're not, you know, you're not, you're not when, when I use the words, it's like this, it's not defining it, is it? It's more or less reminding yourself, it's this simple, it's this awareness that you must trust, not the critical views about yourself or others that, that you, you know, you tend to be conditioned to believe in. This is beyond belief. This isn't about believing in, in Dhamma or in Buddhism or anything like that. It's about trusting in the reality that, that we experience through, through this kind of awareness. Through awareness itself is the means that humanity has to access immortality, to, to realize perfection to realize that they're not what they think and believe, what they're conditioned to, to identify with. They're not like that. Those conditions arise and cease and, and you know, operate according to other conditions. But, they, that's, but what is it that knows the arising and ceasing? Who knows thinking? You know you're thinking when you're thinking. But do you know non-thinking. You can know it if you trust your awareness, not just try to think about non-thinking, but observe the, the gap between one thought and the next, between two thoughts. That gap itself is consciousness that doesn't arise and cease. It's non-personal. And we begin to trust that. And it takes a while to, to really, be, that's where the, what I call real meditation or pavana is, is cultivating that, intentionally referring to that in a constant way as much as possible, not to get entangled so much in the conventions of <clears throat> my life uh, uh, that affect, you know, the, the uh, presence, absence, and happiness and suffering of myself and the community I live with, the society I'm in, but to really put forth an enormous kind of determination to stand as this awareness, be this, because that's what, that's what one is. You know, it doesn't change. And it's the end of suffering. Because if, you, if you're patient and willing to to uh, access, to recognize this, trust it. There's no suffering in it. it can, you can't suffer. Suffering ceases. 
It's the end of suffering, the neuroma, uh, or the end of suffering as, as uh, taught by the Buddha and as the third noble truth. Thank you very much, Jean-Paul. <laughs>